Jr. Pursuing your goals without forsaking your values. Owner of Athletic Resource Management Incorporated, a sports agency which represents some of the top players in professional sports, Kyle Rote Jr. enjoyed a successful soccer career and has written two books on the game. He is also a film actor and television commentator for CBS, ESPN, and PBS. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks very much. I uh, appreciate you being here with us today and all of you uh, in this PAX studio audience as well as those of you at, uh, at home watching on television or on videotape. It's a pleasure to, to be with you today. I feel like as you get to know me over the next uh, little time, I need to probably clarify a couple of things on the front end uh, because you'll understand the framework then of some of the comments that I'm going to make. I don't know that I ever was a great soccer player and it's wonderful to play a sport that nobody knows anything about because you can get away with a great reputation. Uh, and I have to tell you that in all candor, being a great soccer player in America, it's about as important as being uh, a great third baseman in Italy. <laughs> you know, who cares? It doesn't make any difference. And a number of years ago when I started playing the game and we were trying to attract some of the world's greatest athletes to, um, uh, to come to America, Pelé came to America and of course the PR machines being what they are, they tend to overstate things on occasion and they were trying to make this, this great opinion that, gee, Kyle, you're America's answer to Pelé, the greatest soccer player that's ever played. I had to finally remind uh, uh, the New York Times and some other uh, institutions in the interest of their own reputation for veracity <laughs> that um, uh, in our joint careers, Pelé and I together scored about 1,400 goals. And of that total, the 100 that I scored were clearly the most difficult to achieve. <laughs> and uh, while I had a couple of great years, he had a couple of great decades, a little bit of a difference. But right at the end of my career, I was very honored that uh, on occasion, uh, people would include me and Pelé in the same sentence. But unfortunately, the sentence usually was, Kyle wrote, he's no Pelé, but you have to deal with stuff like that. <laughs> But I learned a very important lesson on the front end, and that is that uh, being the best sometimes is not good enough, particularly if what you're really looking to do is to pursue goals in life, maintain your value system, be able to live a life in such a way that when it's all over, you look back and you have very few regrets. All of us are high-performance people, and uh, certainly the, the challenge is clear that uh, in today's modern day of downsizing, right-sizing, whatever you want to call it, uh, as time frames have been reduced, we all have to be extraordinarily competitive. But we also don't want to live our life in such a way that um, we look back and we have, have major regrets. When I think about um, the world of sports and uh, the, the superstars competition that I had a chance to compete in, competition has always been a driving force in my own life as it has been in many people here in our, in our audience and I'm sure for many of you at home as well. Uh, I found myself, for example, one year uh, in a 100-yard dash competition in that ABC television show, The Superstars Competition. And while I did win it three times, that doesn't mean I, I won all the individual events. Just as in any business, you can't always win the price competition. You can't always win the delivery competition. You can't always win the packaging competition. Of course, for many of us, we're trying to sell that combined value today in the marketplace. And I found myself in this 10-sport competition facing to my left in the starting blocks of this 100-yard dash final. O.J. Simpson, who had just broken the single season rushing record for the Buffalo Bills, also happened to be a former world record holder in the 4x100 relay, a fact I wasn't aware of until the next couple of moments uh, when he was in college at USC. Uh, to my right was a guy who caught a few touchdown passes from the arm of Terry Bradshaw during the 1970s for the Pittsburgh Steelers by the name of Lynn Swan. To O.J.'s left was a teammate of Lynn's, the guy who made the so-called immaculate reception during the 1973 playoff game for the Pittsburgh Steelers, the Italian stallion, Franco Harris. And on the far right-hand side was a guy who played for the St. Louis Cardinals. Some of you know the all-time base stealing champion up until just a couple years ago. His name, some of you know? Lou Brock. Lou Brock, right. So we have Lou Brock, Lynn Swan, Kyle Rote, O.J. Simpson, and Franco Harris to run 100 yards. <laughs> now, folks, look at me. <laughs> Now, I don't know how you would have felt in a race like that, but I can tell you for this uh, short-legged soccer man, it was a nightmare. Uh, but it may surprise you to find out I didn't finish last in the race, but that was due to a dog that entered the race about 50 yards in, and I was able to beat the dog to the finish line. Uh, but I had one of those extraordinary experiences that, uh, of course, you never forget, uh, as on national television with Howard Cosell, Frank Gifford, and Keith Jackson announcing, with tens of millions of people watching, I finished dead last for perhaps the first time in my life. In fact, ABC television was already setting up for the next event by the time I got to the finish line, or at least that's the way they made me feel. 
but um, an interesting thing happened that day. The fastest 100-yard dash of my life occurred that afternoon, finishing dead last. See, that's one of the great strengths of competition, is that's one reason I, I love to compete in business and sports and whatever, because it helps bring out the very best in me. I don't hate my competitors. I, I love them. I want them to do well because I know it's going to challenge me to an even, even higher level of performance. That particular day, O.J. Simpson won the race in 9-4. Lynn Swan ran in 9-6. Because of, they were so close, we had to have a photo finish. I was um, OOP. I don't know if you know what that means, but OOP is out of photo. I wasn't even in the <laughs> photo finish picture. And sometimes we don't get the recognition. Sometimes we don't get the reward. Sometimes we don't get the facts that others may get. And yet still, it was that life-changing, it'll be my most memorable 100-yard dash run of my life. That's why I hope you're involved in a company with some high-performance people. I hope in terms of your circle of influence, the people that you're related to in terms of relationships are people who are committed and caring and want to try, try to bring the very best out of life. One of the nicest things about a situation like this, I saw some of you uh, visiting before we got together here and we started the, the cameras. And uh, for those of you at home, I hope that you're watching this uh, program with other people. Uh, that the friendships that come through stress in life. Uh, I've got a friend down in Dallas. I don't, uh, used to live there 15 years and I haven't seen him uh, very much. But we, we talk to each other on the telephone all the time. He does a very unusual thing though. Whenever he calls my house, he pretends like he's somebody else. It's very irritating. Don't, don't do that to your friends. <laughs> For years, he pretended like he was John Wayne, but he was so bad at John Wayne imitations, we didn't even know he was trying to do John Wayne. <laughs> and the only reason we knew he was trying to do Clint Eastwood is because he'd use that phrase, make my day. <laughs> well, a couple of years ago, and it causes all sorts of problems. You know, we've got four kids. My mother has, uh, my mother-in-law visits on occasion, but my wife, because of Henry's phone calling, whenever she hear, hears anything weird on the tele telephone, she hands it to me. So I get all the obscene telephone calls in the family. <laughs> but a couple of years ago, my mother-in-law was visiting our house, and uh, she came running into my office, I'll have a little office in the home, she said, Kyle, Kyle, the President of the United States is on the telephone. <laughs> well, at the time, my mother-in-law was 62 years old, had high blood pressure, prime case for a heart attack. I didn't want her to die anyway, but definitely not in my house, in my office, because of some behavior my wife and I should have squelched 15 years ago when Henry started this thing. So I go in there and I pick up the telephone. And I say, you know, your little sophomoric infantile psychological behavior problem is one thing for Lynn and I to deal with. Start picking on a 62-year-old woman, that's really too much. I wish you would grow up. Then I heard silence. <laughs> then I heard a voice we would all recognize. <laughs> because it was the President of the United States. <laughs> And as you can imagine, now I've got to go into full retreat. I mean, everything changes. My voice changes. Will you see, sir? I have a friend in that. And no matter what you say, there's no way to talk your way out of a situation like that. And the president was very forgiving. He was inviting me to come speak at a White House luncheon. And uh, he kind of forgave me for all that uh, insulting stuff that happened on the telephone. But when I went to the White House, I didn't want to screw up. I didn't want to mess up again. I'd already blown my relationship with him the first time on the telephone. So I didn't eat any lunch at this luncheon. However, I did drink about six glasses of tea. Now, after the program at lunch, we had a great time. I mean, it was a flawless luncheon. And the present was so generous and nice. In fact, he looked at his watch and was all over. He said, you know, I've got 12 minutes before my next appointment. Now, on our calendars, 12 minutes is not a lot of time. But in a presidential calendar, that's an awful lot of time. He says, let me give you a little private tour of the private quarters of our White House here. I said, you know, how do you tell the president? No, sure, whatever, yes, sir, whatever you want. So my wife and I dutifully followed the president, the first lady, past the Marines, up the stairwell, and all of a sudden we're in the private living quarters of the president and the first lady. Now he's beginning to show us around, very gracious host. There's the John Quincy Adams reading room over there. That's the Harry S. Truman bedroom over there. About that time, those six glasses of tea have now hit their biological spot, and with knees coming closer together, as my hand heads towards my groin, I'm beginning to bend over and say, Mr. President, is there a restroom up here? He says, oh yes, the famous Lincoln bathroom, built in 1927. I said, sir, I really don't want the history, I just want the key if you don't mind. <laughs> and so the president ushers my wife and I and into the restroom. I take care of nature's call. But before we go back out to rejoin the president and the first lady, I look at my wife and I say, you know, Lynn, do you realize this is the throne the president sits on every morning right here? <laughs> and then in that communication that perhaps only occurs between closest of friends, baby spouses, I look at her, she looks at me, and without a word being said, the communication is very, very clear. Do you want to look in the medicine cabinet, or am I going to look in the medicine cabinet? 
I mean, we've got one shot to do this. And uh, one shot, you know, it's a little, but about that time, I'm thinking, you know, we don't want to forget this time. Lynn, this is so wonderful. We so, so we start looking around for a souvenir, and here I am at the basin. And I see this beautifully embroidered hand towel. And I'm telling you, folks, it, it, would, it would frame up perfectly on any wall in any office that we would have. It had the rotunda, the pillars. It had the White House, that look that we see behind the White House correspondence every evening on the evening news. And as I begin to put that in my pocket, I say, Rote, you can't do that. That's stealing. So as I put it back there on the bar, I notice on top of the basin is what hotel people would call French milled soap. You know, hardened soap. It's got the writing. It's got the same pillow rotunda. I'm thinking, you know, I can be creative. I'll turn this into a paperweight. I can plasticize it. At a minimum, I could put saran wrap around it and have it there on my desk. But as I picked it up, it had such a heavy, perfumey smell. I could just see the Marines put me up against the wall downstairs. We know the soap somewhere on your rope, we can smell it, you know. <laughs> and USA Today and the New York Times, you know, another pro athlete arrested, you know, stealing soap from the White House wouldn't go, what is not gonna go over very well. And as one cynic recently said, we have more parole models in sports than we have role models today, so I didn't want to add to that particular problem. So I didn't take the towel, I didn't take the soap, but what my wife and I do have from our time at the White House, three sheets of toilet paper. <laughs> We felt like that's a normal consumer allotment. How can anybody disagree with anything like that? Now, an interesting thing, it shows you what peer pressure does, even for adults. My wife was so proud of the three sheets of toilet paper that we have in her purse. She goes downstairs, not one to be quiet, not one to be just silent. Our little secret, she shares it with Mike and Sharon Hargrove. Mike Hargrove is now the current manager of the Cleveland Indians in professional baseball. At that time, he was the American League Rookie of the Year, and his wife, Sharon, got so excited about our capture <laughs> that uh, we are not the only pro-athlete family in America with toilet paper from the White House. In fact, competition being what it is, I have to admit to you that the Hargroves have four sheets of toilet paper <laughs> from the White House, but may I tell you, they may have four sheets of toilet paper, but they're from the common public bathroom on the first floor. <laughs> they don't have the fingerprints of the President and the First Lady from the private living quarters the way we do. Shows you how funny come on symbols can be. We were trying desperately to grab a symbol of our time there. And when I look at life, and, I, and one of the things that I've really learned is that the symbols in life aren't enough to give that sense of joy, that sense of no regret that many of us, if not all of us, are looking for. Uh, I mean, the cars are nice, and the money in the bank account is nice, and the position, and the prestige, all of those things are nice symbols. But they don't necessarily translate into that gut core satisfaction of knowing that our life is significant, that it really counts. I've discovered that that core ID really never comes from being the best, trying your best, or even the symbols of success as worthy as those can be in a certain sense. That ultimately that core ID is really a gift of God. It's believing enough to know that we were not created by chance. It's a believing enough in ourselves to know that God can use me in whatever the circumstance may happen to be. And once we can grab that core identity, I must tell you in the world of sports, it's terribly difficult to do that because it's so beneficial to get those nice hotels rooms and those wonderful tables at restaurants because you're, quote, a celebrity or you're a pro athlete. It's a, a wonderful seduction to enjoy. But if you ever get seduced into believing that what makes you important is that you're a good athlete or that you've got money, then rapidly life turns on you and you become a victim of it before it's all over. There are plenty of examples of all of that, but I, I have to, since I moved to Memphis back in the early 1980s, uh, learned a lot about identity. Identity doesn't just come for individuals, it's for cities, it's for corporations, it's for states. I mean, uh, when I moved to Memphis, I'd never been in a city where the number one rated television show consistently was wrestling. <laughs> yeah, and that was, that was a surprise. Or where the uh, Elvis Index is a daily uh, topic of conversation. Or how about our state of Tennessee? I mean, my uh, daughter, who's 10 years old, is doing a report on Wyoming. I didn't know until last night that Wyoming is known as the equality state. New Jersey is the garden state. Tennessee is the country and western state. I mean, those wonderful te Tennessee songwriters that write such great Tennessee song titles like that one entitled, 
I'd rather have a bottle in front of me than a frontal lobotomy. <laughs> or that other great Tennessee classic. That other great Tennessee classic entitled, um, My Wife Ran Off With My Best Friend. And I sure do miss him. <laughs> or, <laughs> or one that I haven't actually heard the lyrics yet, but I know it's got to be great because it's entitled, I'm going to be number one, or I'm going to number two all over you. <laughs> And then there's a, another one that I really like because of the subtlety of the humor. Uh, and you get really got, it's one of these that says, we're so sad that you're gone, it's almost as if you're still here. <laughs> what a great tradition. You know, so states have, certainly, you know, Federal Express, absolutely positively overnight from a consumer standpoint, inside Federal Express, people service profits. Major corporations have those, those symbols, those identities that almost in a phrase can tell you what they stand for. If you were to think individually, just for the moment, of uh, Jerry Lewis, what charity comes to mind? MDA, right, muscular dystrophy. I mean, his life in the last couple of years has been so clearly identified with MDA that it's difficult to think about the two as separate. I also have to think about a friend of mine who, um, because of his behavior, um, has a horrible reputation at, at a golf club that on occasion I go visit. They, they call it uh, his rule, and Herbert's rule is, kindly refrain from picking up lost golf balls until they've stopped rolling. <laughs> you never know when you're playing with him whether you will find your lost golf ball or probably end up in his bag. But what, what, what is it that people say about you? And I want you to ask, a question of yourself for just a moment. You don't have to tell anybody else, but, but really be honest. I, I want you to think just for a moment about what is it that your mother would say? My mother's no longer living, but what, what would your mother say would define you? What, what maybe of the vices and virtues? Faithful, non-faithful, a fraud, honest, loyal, disloyal, you can almost make up the list of the vices and virtues, but what is it that the people closest to you would say about you? What would your spouse or your girlfriend or boyfriend, what is it that they would say about you? What is it that your boss, the person that you're accountable to from a business standpoint, what would he or she say about you? Honest, dishonest, someone you can trust, someone you can't trust? I'm very fortunate to be uh, the beneficiary of a wonderful gift from my father. I'm Kyle Rote, Jr., not Lee Harvey Oswald, Jr. What a nice thing that is. And it conveys to it because my father has led a life of good integrity. He's been a good man. And, and that certainly is one of the things I want to pass on. I trust that you would want to pass on to your family. My father was a number one draft choice coming out of college uh, in the National Football League, went on to play for about 12 years with the New York Giants, was captain of the Giants all but one of the years that he was there. Went on to broadcast Super Bowls with Kurt Gowdy uh, for the American Football Conference and then later on for NBC. Tremendous broadcaster, athlete, leader, but perhaps no better compliment can be paid to my father than the fact that he had 13 different teammates named sons for him. Frank Gifford has a son named Kyle. Pat Summerall has a son named Kyle. Mel Triplett, Don Heinrich. Ray Beck, Jimmy Patton, and others that I've had a chance to run into over the years, and hundreds of other people around the country that I've had a chance to meet who were named after my father. What a joy that would be for me to be able to pass on, take that baton, pass it on to my own children. And so identity can carry some very, very positive factors. But, but what is the signal that you would stand for? You know, what is it that those groups of people would label you and maybe with each of those three different people your mom your spouse or girlfriend your boss it might paint a little bit different picture they might not all be the same but they probably would be reasonably accurate what is it that you stand for when i look at uh, a lot of the events that i do around the country i have a lot of good memories from times that i've gone speak now i know some of you here, and I, and I 
just ask this question. How many of you have been to one of those national corporation sales meetings? How many of you have been to a national association sales meeting? Just give, give me a show of hands for a second. Uh, and answer this question for me. You, when you go to one of those, you know the program, you got seminars, and all of a sudden you come towards the end. Who is getting ready to get up and speak? Other than an outside speaker, who, who are some of the people who might speak at the, uh, at the closing moments of a convention, business convention? President. The president would be, right? Or chairman board? sales manager, those kind of things. A friend of mine, Dr. Howard Hendricks, was down in Dallas a couple years ago, and he had just spoken as an outside speaker, and the national sales manager was getting ready to give this impassioned plea, this motivational moment, yelling and screaming, and as he stood up, he kind of got in this mock rage, and he said, and this happened to be a dog food industry, and he jumped up, and he said, who's got the greatest advertising? Of course, they said, we do, we do, because they're trained like Pavlovian dogs, you know, even if they didn't believe it, they're going to say it, you know, who Who's got the best manufacturing plant? We do. Who's got the best customer service? We do. Then his final closing question, which everyone anticipated and expected, who's got the best sales force? And with that, everyone said, we do, we do. And everyone stood up and applauded. And then he asked the cutting question, then why do we rank 18th of the 19 companies in the dog food industry? <laughs> To which one of the salesmen standing next to my friend, Dr. Hendricks, looked over and said, because dogs don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> and learn, you know, that, that lesson, that it's true with people, too. You know, we can exceed in an extraordinary way in a certain aspect of our own lives and yet still fail in other areas of life. We can have a tremendous lead dog out there, and that's important to do, we can have, again, as we said, the money, the, the, the prestige, the power. We can have the house. We may even be able to get our teenagers through their teenage years without major problems, which is what I'm in the middle of right now. Pray for me, folks. <laughs> but I, I've often found that what a waste it is to sometimes climb that ladder of success for years and sometimes decades, only to discover when you get to the top of the ladder it's leaning against the wrong building because it doesn't give you that satisfaction, that gut that says life is significant, even with all the problems, even with everything that's gone on. One of the examples that we can think of where we've had success in part, but something's lacking in the whole. Think of a Pete Rose. I used to compete against Pete, and, and I consider him a, a good friend. Pete was extraordinarily successful. I don't know anyone in baseball that was more committed to the game than Pete was but there's a part of his life that he's not going to be able to enjoy. Nadia Comaneci, one of the great gymnasts, Eastern Europe, attempting to commit suicide. Best, at, best gymnast in the world in her time, and yet she discovered that her own athletic performance wasn't up. Ivan Boski had a, enjoyed a lot of success for a while until they discovered insider trading was part of his modus operandi. We look around and see Prince Charles and Lady D and the tabloid coverage of their despair. I think of the young lady down in Texas who was swimming one time, proud father up in the stands, yelling down for her daughter, way to go, honey, and was so obnoxious that people around him almost wanted to see his daughter fail just to see how this guy would handle the failure of his daughter. And he'd say, honey, I've taught you how to be a champion. We've bought you the, the lessons to make you an Olympic swimmer. The next, Donna De Verona. Uh, and as people listened and watched, suddenly their sense was there's something wrong here. And indeed there was, because as the race started in this 200 medley, four different strokes, 50-yard pool, she takes off, she has, has a beautiful dive, and he's yelling and screaming. And as she heads down towards that first flip turn, she takes that flip turn, and you can tell she is trained. I mean, this guy has put out some bucks for her. And it, but as she starts to head down towards that second touch, two girls begin to slowly catch up, and he's starting to yell and scream, don't you dare let anybody beat you. Of course she can't hear in the froth of the pool. Takes that next flip turn. In fact, coming out of that second flip turn now, two girls begin to pass her. And as it turns out, as she takes the last flip turn to head home, not only is she not going to finish first, she's probably not going to finish third. As it turns out, she ends up finishing fifth. And this man, outraged, races down from the stands, heads down towards the end of the pool. The mother, having seen this routine a few times, puts the cross body block on him to try to keep 
the dad from the daughter and he's gesturing over his wife's shoulders wait till I get you home I'll show you what it's like to finish anything but first his daughter down in the pool holding up four fingers and he is heard to say you idiot you can't even count you didn't finish fourth you finished fifth only to find out a few moments later that the four fingers that she was holding up did not refer to the place that she finished but to the number of seconds she took off the best previous time she'd ever swum sports success business success it's a wonderful goal but it's a horrible god and whenever we get seduced into believing that any of those kind of successes is going to give us that heart satisfaction then we fooled ourselves last couple of years in the world of sports it's not just a situation like this as tragic as that is we've had four heisman trophy winners in jail four cy young award winners in jail over 30 super bowl champions in jail sports illustrated says that we had our 77th former major league baseball player recently commit suicide because when you let your identity be driven by your vocational success whatever it may happen to be you're set up for failure because ultimately there's someone else that comes along that's better there's someone else that is in the spotlight. And perhaps the greatest example, I guess, of all of that, is a friend of all of ours uh, in many ways. As you look out and you see Magic Johnson, as we've watched him go through what he's had to go through. And yet Magic, I would have to say, as much as I would love to play with the man as a player, unselfish player, I'd love to be a teammate of his, to have received his passes, but Magic is an example of kind of the reverse standards version of America today in the sense where we, we want to make a tragedy out of someone whose behavior led him to his result where he is and I'm not insensitive to AIDS and I I mean Arthur Ashe I think was an absolute tragedy here's a guy who went in for open heart surgery his behavior had nothing to do with the result and I certainly want the very best for magic and I, and I want us to do all that we can for people who have HIV but we're foolish if we don't make sure all of us and our kids understand is that the result of Magic's life is the predictable result of behavioral choices made over a long period of time. He was warned by A.C. Green, by other members of the staff with the Lakers against the behaviors that got himself into trouble. And those, those still principles, those principles still operate even today. But perhaps maybe even, even a better memorable moment to help us remember this particular principle it, it, let me ask you, the great quarterback, I've mentioned his name already once today, the great quarterback of the 1970s for the Pittsburgh Steelers was Terry Bradshaw. The great quarterback of the 1980s for the San Francisco 49ers was Joe Montana. And interestingly, the most successful team from 1965 to 1990 happened to be a team that we wouldn't ordinarily think of, the Oakland Raiders or the L.A. Raiders. They had a left-handed quarterback, uh, Kenny Stabler. Those three quarterbacks, Kenny Stabler, Joe Montana, Terry Bradshaw, among them, I almost don't have enough fingers to show you the number of Super Bowl rings they have. All three of them have been Super Bowl MVPs, the best players on the best teams in the world. They have nine Super Bowl rings between them. They also have nine wedding rings between them. And may I tell you, they and their families truly understand the thrill of Super Bowl victory and the agony of family defeat. Now, it's, it's not, you know, I come from a broken home. My folks split up, and it's cer certainly very survivable. But at a minimum, and I'm not taking sides in any of those situations as to why those things happen, but at a minimum, it's the death of a little civilization. At a minimum, when a divorce occurs, it's the death of a hope that was entered into at the altar. Sports success or any type of success doesn't guarantee it, and if you could, the Super Bowl MVPs would be able to do that. Well, how do we pursue pursuing our goals without forsaking those values. And I, and I would submit to you that just to start out, all, all of us here, all of us at home are one of three people. We're either average people, we're fools or we're wise people. And the simple definitions, the average person makes a mistake, pays a price, learns from that, and goes on. The fool continues to make the same mistake time and time and time again, has to keep paying the price time and time and time again. But it's the wise person who's able to look at life, to look at each other, to see what is it that I can learn from the experience of others so I don't have to walk that same path of semi-destruction or pain. And by your presence here, it's obvious that all of you are interested in learning, being exposed to other concepts and ideas. And so certainly I would anticipate that everyone here and all of you watching at home would be wise people. But as wise people, 
as we watch other people, we better not get focused really on what the loss is because for some, like the Pete Rose, maybe it's loss of the Hall of Fame. For others, maybe it's loss of a family. For others, maybe it's a, a loss of financial position in an industry. But that, that gets us distracted because whatever is lost is a tragedy. It's unfortunate. I've had to pay a price sometimes from sins of omission and sums of, of commission. I wish as I look back on my life, I had said thank you to more people. That was really, those are, I wish I had done that. On occasion, people that know me know I'm, I can be a real soft touch for people that are struggling. And, and in that process, I can be an enabler. I, I, I can actually not be helping the very people I'm trying to help because sometimes I have to have tough love and just say no to people even though their situation is, is desperate. But the good news is that you and I can pursue our goals without having to fear being victims. The better news is that you can go from casualty to champion, that you can go from victor to victim. And the best news of all is that everyone here can be a champion of something. That sounds maybe a little bit crazy, but what kind of champion, what kind of victor are we even talking about? Well, if you're involved in the free enterprise industry, let me tell you, if you've tried to start a business or you're out there trying to make it and from a commission standpoint or you're just trying to fight up the, the stream, you're part of something that is precious. Cubans have been trying to get an unworthy sea craft to cover shark infested waters, not to come to America because we have sports, because every country has sports. They're not coming here because of television, Every country almost has television. They're coming here because it's the free enterprise opportunity to make or break yourself. Why did those Chinese get dropped off at the Golden Gate Bridge, having given up life savings with no jobs, no connections, no vocational feeling that couldn't even take their wealth with them? They just wanted to be in America, to have a chance to compete on the fields of the free enterprise system with you and with me. So if you're in that arena, you can be a champion of free enterprise. How about uh, champion of integrity? Some of you know that uh, Gary Player plays in the senior tour. I remember watching an event a couple of years ago. He, t he took a putt on a par three, made a birdie, and yet after the round he went up and when he turned in his scorecard, he turned in a three on that hole. And people looked around and they said, Gary, what's wrong? You, you, you've signed an incorrect scorecard. You, you've given yourself one stroke too many. He said, no. He said, I, I, I had a three on that hole. They went back. They got the videotapes. They pulled it out. I said, Gary, look, you, you put it on the green and you put the ball in the hole. He said, no, but see, my putter hit the ball as I was preparing my swing. And when your ball hits the putter by the rule, that's a stroke. You couldn't even see it as good as videotape was that the ball didn't even move, but he knew person of integrity. Jack Nicklaus, great golfer, out playing a good round, and as some of you know, he, he's done a lot of things in his life. Played a, a lot of golfers after they hit a round, come on, hit some practice shots. He went on and hit some more practice shots, and a guy in the gallery behind him said, oh, Mr. Nicklaus, as Jack hit one perfect nine iron, about 160 yards, his caddy was almost right there, the ball landed right at his side. He said, oh, Mr. Nicklaus, he said, I, I'd love to be a, hit a golf ball the way that you do, and Jack, professionally trained, they go through all that PR school and PGA, he turned around did his hat, thanks very much. Jack hit a couple more shots, and then he hit one that I think hit the bucket. And the guy goes, oh, oh Mr. Nicholas, I'd do anything to hit a golf ball the way that you would, in which he then looked around and said, please don't say that. I said, no, no, Mr. Nicholas, I love you. I, I, I've watched you play all the time. I'd do anything to hit a golf ball the way that you do. And Jack said, no, don't say that because you wouldn't, because if you would, you would have been hitting hundreds of shots a day every day for the last 18 years the way that I've been doing it. It's one thing to say you want to be successful. It's a whole other thing to have the daily discipline to try to do that. Champion of integrity, champion of discipline. How about a young lady on a college campus in North Carolina dating a guy that uh, perhaps has a chance to go into pro basketball by the name of Tess. And, and she is, sees this guy Bobby, Bobby Jones, some of you know who followed basketball. He's getting ready to go off on the Olympic team, make a lot of money. There were two leagues at that time, the ABA, the NBA. And Love is in the air, it's spring, 
She's been praying for three months that Bobby would ask her to get married. And on this day, the otherwise very organized Bobby Jones begins to kind of stumble across himself and his words stumble. And he's saying, Tess, you know, I really have enjoyed getting to know you. And Tess, I, I don't know what's going to happen in the Olympics, but Tess, I'll come back. I'll sign a big contract. I'll get you a house at Myrtle Beach. I'll get you whatever car you want. Tess, I'll get you whatever clothes you want. Tess, you know I love you. What are you saying? Let's get married. Finally popped the question. To which she said, no. Not only was he surprised to hear that, but she was surprised to hear that coming out of her own mouth. She went on to say, Bobby, I just don't believe I'm going to marry someone that I don't believe is totally committed to God. Now, had I been Bobby Jones, I would have said, fine, Tess, you little religious fanatic. You go stand right over there, sweet thing. Who else would like to go out with the All-American basketball player here in North Carolina, getting ready, ready to make a million dollars a year and be a gold medalist? And I can guarantee you Bobby Jones would have had no difficulty finding companionship. But because of the courage of that woman to hold up to a standard that she had been committed to, Bobby retired from the NBA not only as a great player, but he also retired along with Julius Irving as co-presidents of the NBA Fellowship, put on all the chapels for all the NBA teams. Not just a basketball leader, not just an athletic leader, but a spiritual leader. And today is making one thirtieth of what he made in the NBA and is at peace and happy because he's not driven by his income. That doesn't define him. He's driven by that gift from God that we talked about that says he's important whatever his job is at that moment in time, whatever his level of income is at that time, whatever his struggle is at that moment of time. So you can be a champion of integrity, you can be a champion of discipline, you can be a champion of courage. How about a young lady here from the state of Tennessee where I now live? She uh, recently uh, passed away, young Wilma Rudolph, braces on her legs at the age of nine. Someone invited her into a basketball game said, Wilma, we have five against four. We need somebody on the court. So young Wilma comes out. They never throw her the ball. She hobbles up and down the court in these braces. They never throw her the ball, hobbles up and down. But someone invited her into the game. Someone invited her into the game. That hobbling up and down on a basketball court ultimately made not only a very good basketball player, which she became, but she went on to be able to represent the United States in track and field despite the early polio in her life came out of the braces and embraced the world's best athletes. The Olympic competition won three medals, but not just any three medals. She won three gold medals. Broke a few records, but not just three Olympic records. She also broke three world records. The age of 19, 10 years after, she was hobbling up and down on a basketball court in North Tennessee, and someone invited this person into the game, perhaps the least likely person to ever be able to go out and run on a track and field. It's not ours to judge necessarily the total limitations on a person, but to invite people into a game. What about the great, uh, the, the basics? John Wooden, the great NCAA basketball coach at UCLA, would take all these All-American players. He'd have them come into the campus, and he'd say, here's what I want you to do the first day. I want you to take on and put off your socks. Can't touch a basketball. Lou Alcindor, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Greatest players, Bill Walton, can't touch a basketball day one with Coach John Wooden because he is committed to the basics. He's a champion of basics. You have to learn how to put your socks on and off so that you don't have a wrinkle in your sock because a wrinkle ultimately could cause you to get a blister and a blister would hurt you down the road. And we don't need players with blisters as we go into the NCAA tournament. Second day, you graduated from socks. What did you go into on the second day? We well, went into shoes. You got to put your shoes on the second day, but you had to make sure that when you tighten your shoes, there was equal pressure at every outlet or it didn't work. John went on to set records that perhaps will never be broken as a coach. Didn't just get great players, committed to the basics. What about being a person of appreciation? Basketball, what does this mean? Someone makes a bucket and you see him do that? What does that mean? Some of you? He got an assist. Got an assist? That's a way to say thank you. It's a way to say thank you to someone. Without that pass, I couldn't have been the man. We see that Boomer Esiason when he coached at Cincinnati when they went to the Super Bowl. We had a player that played for the Cincinnati Bengals that we represent. Couldn't get hold of him on Thursday nights. Why? Because his quarterback would have he and his wife out for dinner every Thursday night to say thank you. One thing to say thank you in a moment in, in words. It's another way to say thank you with time. And he certainly did that. Well, what about uh, being a champion of solutions? Some of you know that in business, one of the most difficult things sometimes is to get the right people 
from a marketing standpoint to be able to sell to and that was a problem with it one of these mini markets they couldn't get people into their yard because the kids on friday and saturday nights they would just cruise this 7-eleven type place and they put a sign signs didn't work then they hired security people security people didn't work kids still figured out a way to get past the security people we have to go make a telephone call and that one car with 18 kids would go in there and that one person would stand on the telephone talking to nobody and the kids would all be in the parking lot Finally, an hourly worker figured out the answer, brilliant response, to get rid of the kids cruising. Cost $180, put speakers up on top of that little mini market, and played Frank Sinatra music all night long. <laughs> it's a lot of things. A lot of things that we can be champions of. How about, uh, how about champions of, of faith? I remember my mother, she, she committed herself to God at 36, 39, she had a stroke. She was paralyzed in a wheelchair for the rest of, your, of her life. And I can remember thinking, Mom, uh, this is going to be really tough, but she always had such a great attitude. And as it turned out, she uh, invited me down to San Antonio when it looked like she was going to die. We knew she was going to die within the next year. And she said, uh, uh, Kyle, would you, would you help me put together my own funeral, plan my own funeral? I said, well, sure, Mom. What hymns do you want? She told me the name of the hymns. I'd write them down, put them on the word processor, went on back home. and came back one time and said, Mom, here are the hymns. These are the ones that you want. And she said, yes. She looked down and she said, but you need to do something else. I said, well, sure, Mom. What do you want me to do? She said, uh, you need to tell jokes at the funeral. I said, Mother, you don't tell jokes at a funeral. And with her one arm that wasn't paralyzed, she looked at me and she said, well, if you're not going to tell jokes, I'm not going to die then. <laughs> I said, Mother, I said, why do you want me to tell jokes at the funeral? She said, because I want everyone to be doing exactly what I'll be doing at that moment in time, laughing at death. And what a joy it was for me to see this woman, a champion of faith, despite being wheelchair-bound, bedridden, stroke-impaired, to see her life terminate from a physical sense, but knowing a satisfaction that is rare in this life, because God was able to use her even from a wheelchair and teaching other people speech there, which was her training, and give her a sense of significance that her physical state could not even steal from her. A lot of ways that we can all be champions. There's a young lady here in town. I say young. She's in her 90s now, I think, by the name of Little Honey. Her name is Norma Taylor. And Norma, on occasion, would write me a letter. She'd say, Kyle, I just want to let you know. And she has, she's arthritic. She can't write a lot. It's very painful. She'd write a little message. She'd say, Kyle, just want to let you know I'm praying for you and your family while you're going to be on the road the next week. Just to know that somebody cares. Someone took enough time to be willing to, to do that. How special that was. What about uh, self-control? The uh, basketball referee who wanted to give a technical to one of the coaches in Boston Garden a couple years ago. And he knew the coach wanted a technical, so he didn't want to give it to him. And finally, the coach took out this towel and he put it down. And the referee would just jump over the towel on the court, trying to ignore it. But you can't ignore a towel on a basketball court. And finally, it was going to endanger the players. So th they had to do something. So the referee got thinking and finally blew the whistle and came over to the coach. And this coach went from a mock rage into fall on the floor laughter. Didn't find out until after the game what the referee said, but it was brilliant. He said, coach, go sit down. You're just mad because my favorite team is winning. <laughs> Lots of different ways that we can deal. Lots of ways we can be a champion of something. It doesn't have to be of anything dramatic, but of those character virtues that each and every one of us have a chance to pursue. That can affect a, a circle of influence that each and every one of us have. I absolutely love, at the airport, calling the cashier by name. They look at me like I'm a crazy person. They're so shocked someone's called them by name, it's like, how'd you know me? So well, you got a name tag. Well, but no one ever called me by name. Little things to be able to affirm the significance of another person. Perhaps the greatest example, though, is a friend of mine that, uh, by the name of Bob. Bob, you know, we're all to dream great dreams, to set great goals, and Bob wanted to do that as well. Bob's dream was to be drafted by the Baltimore Orioles and play in Memorial Stadium in Baltimore, Maryland, but instead he was drafted as some as you, uh, as you were by the U.S. Army, when had to go play in the fields of Southeast Asia. Trained as a combat medic, Bob, racing to the aid of a buddy, had an 82-millimeter mortar round blow up 
and blew both his legs off just below his groin. Left for dead in the field, but because of his courage, his friends didn't want to see his body taken and mutilated because at that time the Vietnamese would take an American soldier's body, they'd string it up, they'd mutilate it, proving the American fighting soldiers could be beaten and as a symbol to the people in those little communities. So they drug his body back. Bob, being a medic, he had a ventilator in his belt. They took the ventilator, tried to keep some oxygen. Maybe there was a way to save this guy. Got back to a MASH-like little field hospital. Surgeons had nothing else going on that day. They said, maybe we, can re maybe we can restart this guy. Maybe we can find a vital sign. Sutured off the arteries and veins, cauterized a lot of the bloody stump. Somehow, we're able to get this guy restarted. Took 12 quarts of transfusions. He contracted malaria, but he was alive. Nine weeks later, he woke up from his coma in the hospital, and he had immediate clarity. Knew exactly where he was, and his first thought was, now I can go back and play baseball. But in the next few moments, as he laid in that hospital bed, began to explore his body, and in particular, as he got below his waist, he discovered what you and I would know, and that is we've got a guy in pro baseball today by the name of Jim Abbott that can play with one hand, but you can't play baseball without your legs. Dreams blown up, perhaps unfairly. They came to Bob, they said, Bob, you're gonna be in a wheelchair for the rest of your life. You have to get very strong in your upper body. So they bought him a 10 pound weight, but because of the muscle atrophy, because he had been in a coma for so long, he couldn't even lift a 10 pound weight. So he had to start with a book. Then he graduated to a shoe. Then he finally got to a 10 pound weight. And after multiple workouts every day for nine years, Bob was so strong in his upper body, he was in a position not only to maybe get around in a wheelchair well, but maybe even to set the world record in the bench press. Laying on his back, pushing a bar towards the sky. And on one weekend, Bob not only broke the world record once, he broke it twice, until the following Monday, he was stripped of his world records. Why? Well, because of the jealousy of fellow competitors, who reminded Bob that, uh, and the judges that he wasn't wearing the proper equipment. Specifically, he was not wearing shoes. Tough to wear shoes when you have no legs. Laying in that hospital bed uh, years before, Bob, said this, God, I don't know what you can do with a legless baseball player, but here I am. I don't know what your circumstance may happen to be, those of you here in the studio, those at home, but being a legless baseball player, not too many things are more pitiful than that. But see, Bob understood that life is, you, you give, and when things happen, you don't throw a pity party, you just keep going, you persevere. And he decided he's going to learn how to walk on his hands now after this world record was taken away. So he went to like a wood shop. He got these wooden clogs with leather straps. And even today, Bob walks this way, puts his hands out, swings his lower body. He's got kind of a gunny sack that ends right here where his body ends, straps up on his shoulders. He decided he was going to raise some money for some of America's homeless people, learn how to walk around a track on his hands, co collapse. Couldn't make it the first time around. But amazing things happen when you're driven by God's power, not by man's power. Bob ultimately completed one lap of that track. In fact, he completed a few things. The Marine Corps Marathon, 26.2 miles on his hands. Then he completed a little thing that happens every year in Kona, Hawaii, called the Ironman Triathlon, which is without stopping a 2.4 mile in the ocean, immediately followed by a 112 mile bicycle race. And yes, they had to re-engineer the bike so he could pedal it with his hands, immediately followed by a 26.2 mile marathon. Then some idiot in sports television in New York City had the gall to come up to Bob after he finished the New York Marathon for the second time and came up and said, Bob, don't you feel embarrassed finishing last in a race? Bob had a very simple answer. I wish I could be as creative as he was. He said, you know, I don't so much focus on finishing last as I do a finishing ahead of 240 other million Americans who perhaps never had the courage to try, which is a pretty good answer. <laughs> Bob did one other little bitty thing. He uh, decided he was going to uh, start walking across the state of California Got some buddies, felt sorry for him. He was a Vietnam vet, lost his legs, got a lot of sympathy. Got this van, they started from the Golden Gate Bridge, started headed across California, and after a couple of days, he didn't quit. After a few more days, he didn't quit. Then the guy said, hey, Bob, we got jobs, we got families, we gotta go back home. He said, fine, I understand. After the 14th day, everyone, I think, but two people left, had to go back, understandably. I think it was the 17th day, had the final meeting on the 17th day, they finally had to shake hands and say goodbye because these people had to go back home and they turned the van around, had the van, and they went on back. But a legless baseball player continued on east. Three years, eight months, and six days later, guess who shows up at the Vietnam Memorial in Washington, D.C., having walked across America on his hands? A legless baseball player that some would consider a loser that I can tell you folks has more courage in his pinky than I have in my whole body. 
See, we make champions on occasions out of the wrong people. And certainly dozens of ways that you and I can explore life in such a way that we can exude a championship quality and some character personality trait. There's certainly two kinds of greatness we've all heard. You know, there's the primary greatness, the greatness of character. There's a the secondary greatness, the greatness of celebrity. It's the difference between Mother Teresa and Madonna. And in our culture today, the celebrity gets emphasized way, way too much. Albert Schweitzer, as many of you know, one time said that uh, when I see people, I see two people. I see the person that they are today, but also I see the person they can become tomorrow. That's part of what today is all about, is to open up your eyes and open up my own eyes as I look at my own life to realize that I am special and I've got an opportunity, even if I can't win a championship to be a champion. Maybe for me it's got to be loyalty to my family. Maybe for me it's got to be rec giving recognition, a champion of recognition at the airport to that cashier. Some way to affirm life. I don't know a lot about your own personal situation, but I do know this, that if you're willing to see Every moment of every day is an opportunity. You have understood one of the great lessons that Mother Teresa teaches, the Nobel Peace Prize winner. When you've been over there with Mother Teresa for a while, she, particularly if you're from the West, she'll say, come here, please, and you go over there, and she, this young woman, little woman, she says, tell me your name, and you tell her your name, she says, where are you from? You tell her where you're from, and she'll say this. You need to go home to Memphis, Tennessee. There's a Calcutta of even more desperate and great, greater need than there is here in Calcutta. See, it's easy to go to Calcutta when you have an airplane ticket in your pocket, because you can always go home. Mother Teresa is not only a champion of love, but she's a champion of focus and perspective because she understands that there's an opportunity in every day, in every way, for each and every one of us to affirm our humanity and the gift that God has given us. For willing also to seek the availability like Bob did and like Tess did. You know that young lady, Tess? Strange part of her story. She'd been praying for three weeks that Bob would ask her to get married, but she said no. I asked Tess one time when I met her, I said, Tess, is all this true? She said, yes. I said, but something doesn't make sense, Tess. You've been praying for him to ask you to get married, but you said no. And she said, well, what you did know is I had been praying for three weeks, three months that Bob would ask me to get married, but I'd also been praying for three years. And when someone finally asked me to get married, I'd have the courage to hold to my commitment that I was only going to marry a godly man. See, God was faithful in that situation. Good news is, if you test continues to grow, even today, but I think better news is, if you say anything to Bob about his wife, Tess, he'll knock your head off. <laughs> because he not only loves her physically and loves her emotionally, but he loves her for the standard that she set that caused him to really reconsider what his life was all about. There are a lot of ways that we can be champions, and if we'll see that availability like Bob did, like Tess did, to have God's wisdom, to have God's strength, to be able to live life out, then our daily activities will be driven by a vision of eternal significance. they will not only be acts of service in a company, not only be acts of pursuit of a goal, but they'll be acts of loyalty to your family. There'll be acts of love to yourself, and on occasion, maybe even act of worship to the living God. In some, your life will be a life of few regrets. And to achieve this, let me encourage you to accept from God the importance that He says you have. Forget your bank account, forget your position, forget what anyone else says about you. Accept that importance that He says that you have. Be willing to accept that power that only he can give to do the amazing things like Tess and Bob have done, to accept that possibility of significance. Where you are right now, not in Calcutta, but whatever your situation may happen to be, in your family, in your job, in your school, and in relationships, what will you be a champion of? What is it? What will be the character quality that you will pursue? 
for every person here in the studio watching on television on tape there's something that you can be a champion of it's one thing to be a champion of sport as we've discussed but I can tell you and I hope you understand after my presentation it's much more important to be a champion of character let me also remind you that Patriots are not merely missiles that knock scuds out of the sky over the Middle East, but patriots are men and women who display a commitment to excellence with integrity on a daily basis right here in America. Because excellence with integrity not only leads to success, it is success. So as a champion of sports, I honor you as a champion of learning by your presence today. May each of us also be a champion of some aspect of character because it's that essential ingredient that is a great American tradition that will help keep America great. May God grant you and me the wisdom in those pursuits. Thanks very much. If you'd like to add this program to your library, it is available on home video for $24.95 plus $4.50 shipping and handling, or the complete five-tape personal success series featuring Jane Parati, Don Hudson, Wallene Dockery, Kyle Rote Jr., and Frank McGuire can be ordered for $99 plus $5.75 shipping and handling. To order by credit card, call toll-free 1-888-954-4455.